lead belly a musician a drifter or a murderer that's what lead belly was he was really all three huddy Ledbetter, better known to the music world as lead belly was an american folk blues singer songwriter and guitarist he mastered just about any instrument he laid his hands on from strumming the guitar to folding the accordion playing the mandolin and even tickling the ivories on occasion he had the ability to perform a variety of songs in any style but this musician had a dark side he led a notoriously violent life making him a legend he later became known as the king of the 12-string guitar and stella as he affectionately called his guitar became his ticket to life and his ticket to freedom lead belly used music to express his heart and soul so when it came to his 30-year imprisonment for killing a man in dallas he used his musical talents to seek a pardon but that wasn't the end of his run-ins with the law from tragic beginnings through even more tragic choices and adding up to a big dollop of Lou Gehrig's disease, what a wild and terribly interesting life Lead Belly led. Join us in this episode as we continue to dive into the life of Lead Belly with a guy that grew up just down the way from Lead Belly's Louisiana stomping grounds, Justin Wells. Hailing originally from Blanchard, Louisiana, a sleepy suburb of Shreveport, Justin grew up just a few miles down County Road 1 from Mooringsport where Lead Belly's story began. And while Justin may have significantly less stabbings on his record, he's known the life of a traveling minstrel and songwriter uh, all too well. So let's dig into this stabby, murdering, swampy January edition of Country Music's Dead. Giddy up, motherfuckers. I don't care if country music's dead. That's how you know that the American experiment is crumbling. Choco Taco's gone. Oh, 100%. We lived in a trailer at the end of a dead end road. So how do we pass our time? Uh, me and my brother would play one-on-one -on -one baseball, which is not a thing. <laughs> Ride dirt bikes at least one time, uh, throw glass jars at each other. I think that I have become angrier when pen is hitting paper, but I think that I am better, if you want to use that word, at, at kind of masking that. There's just too much wrong to be singing about all the right, you know? If you could host a game show, what, what game show would you host? My game show would air on ABC at 8 o'clock on Monday nights, and it would be a uh, draw and quarter this politician. Hey, gang. Welcome to Country Music's Dead, Cowpunks and Railbirds. Welcome back. Happy 2023. My New Year's resolution is to say fuck a lot less, but no promises. Go like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your pods. But honestly, the best thing you can do is tell a friend. I can buy all the ads in the world, but nothing beats you telling a friend about the show. And I can't wait to tell all you guys about my friend, Justin Wells. I'm Matt Wells, your troubadour tickler. And quite frankly, I'm absolutely tickled to death to have my friend, my brother from another mother, the big homie, Justin Wells, on today. And if you don't know uh, how you got here or where you, oh, I'm going to do that part again. I'm Matt Wells, your troubadour tickler, and quite frankly, I'm absolutely tickled to death to have my friend, my brother from another mother, the big homie Justin Wells on today. And if you don't know where you are or how you got here, you're listening to Country Music's Dead. Our guest this week spent an aimless couple of years trying to put a band together in rural Kentucky. He moved to Lexington and immediately launched the cult favorite Southern rock band Fifth on the Floor. The group released a couple of well-received well independent records before teaming up with Shooter Jennings on the breakout record. Uh, that was about, what, 2013? Is that right? Yeah. All right. Uh, that debuted on the Billboard charts, I believe, uh, following uh, kind of an unforeseen breakup from a fan side. So we'll, we'll dig into that. But, uh, you know, things uh, were kind of like Ross and Rachel and friends, uh, you know, people were devastated people cried um but uh, since that uh yeah right uh but we all came to know and love and respect justin for his solo work um like a skilled architect uh, he builds complex songs and albums with uh bricks from our everyday lives so without further ado let's dig into the suburbs of shreveport with a little bit of a tale of a murderous musician named lead belly and the music of our friend justin wells Welcome to the show, buddy. How's 2023 treating you so far? It's great, man. I've had uh, I've had pajama pants on the entire year so far, I think. Well, better than me. I don't have pants on right now. I'm just going uh, back to the pandemic dress. I am too. I actually, I started growing my hair out again. Um, I, I, I haven't... I'm not even going to talk about it. I talked about it last time. I can go like three weeks without shaving and I can't grow anything. Um, 
So do you do you manicure or do you just kind of let it go? With Listen, the man, it's embarrassing how ignorant I am of all like self care things. Uh, I didn't start using any sort of like beard oil till like two years ago. I'm pretty terrible. That's pretty good though. I mean, you're turning a corner. Uh, you're growing as an artist and as uh, a beard bearded man. So that's good. I'm going um, did we? Uh, did you re- encounter much lead belly folklore growing up in the area? No, definitely not, man. Um, you know, I think you and I are of a similar age, so let's just be honest. I got hit to Lead Billy, uh, you know, from Kurt Cobain. Um, after yeah. moving from Louisiana. Um and yeah. then kind of went backwards, you know. Uh, you know, most of what I knew about music down there at the time, I mean, I moved when I was twelve or thirteen. Um, so I'm kind of this like hybrid with, with feet in both. Uh, I think any sort of weird darkness might come from the Louisiana part, but, uh, but yeah, no, yeah, man. I, mean, I actually I have a new... question. I have a question about that at the end of, uh, which one, weird you know, darkness. uh, had, yeah, had the, had the influence, uh, you know, that was, you know, deriving everything. So, cause you definitely live in like, first off, like you have parishes, you have commonwealths, like you barely are an American citizen. You Dude, know, like <laughs> you know a, what I mean? Like, it's like, that's like weird theocracy still, still running shit. Hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's like how are there still old white Democrats? Like what is going on? Um, yeah, so um there, how is twenty twenty two overall now that we've now that we're into twenty three, looking back on twenty two, you know, what kind of year was it for you? I know you had a really good run there towards the end that you seem to have enjoyed. Um the merch has been great. I'm broke, but thank you. Um <laughs> but yeah, just how did how did twenty twenty two go for you? I know a guy, man, you can call him. Uh it went well, dude. It, we kind of we were doing some shuffling uh, on my team. There's always a real pain in the ass, and I'm I'm like this guy that just like loves everybody, and so I, you know I never want to part ways with anybody. But um, so it's kind of in flux for the first half of the year while we were also making the record, um, and the way the year ended, I couldn't have predicted. I mean, I'm running with a a hell of a crew now, and uh, and I've got a record for you to hear. Hey, that's what I like. Um, man, I oh, I just like the the last album. I I mean, I haven't hung up on my wall in the living room. Uh, that's just that was fantastic work. So I, you know, I know you're probably still on a heater, so I can't wait uh, can't wait to hear it. So yeah. uh, I did see before we jump in that you uh, went to the JTE tribute uh, the other night. How was that? I cried so much, man. It, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I, there, there, nothing but highlights. Let me, you know, I don't like taking the spotlight off Justin on the thing, but Emmy Lou came out to a standing ovation. The only artist that did, and it was, it was so correct of the audience. Um, mm. But yeah, Joe, she... Joe Pug did Mama's Eyes, and uh, and he broke at the end, bud, and and I broke with him. It, it was it was hard. It was hard. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many seats are in that place, but I felt like I knew every, everybody I knew was there <laughs> or something. Well, seemingly like was... so. I posted about it, and then, like, the comments were – I mean, there was there was definitely a dude wearing the uh, Justin Wells is not real shirt. And yes. uh, he said I had to be quick to point out the Wells because otherwise I think I was going to get in a fight. I was like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe <think." laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, no, it, was, it looked like a great show. Um, I remember – it was like 2010 he played in Indy and he didn't play in Indy again for about a decade until I had him at Holler on the Hill, I think, um, because he got arrested that night. <laughs> and so that may he, have been, uh, I think I heard about that show. I think that show, you know, was was maybe not one of the somebody kept ones. yelling at him to play Freebird and yeah, and he like lost his mind and, and then the crowd got mad and it was just like a malice in the palace situation. Like the staff, the crowd, him, everybody were just going nuts. And so uh, he swore Indy off for about a decade, um, unfortunately, to, to, you know, obviously the fans got missed out on a lot of good music. But uh, we had him back at Holler on the Hill in like 2018, 2019, and it was awesome. Um, and that was the last time I think I, I got to see him. But Glad you got to go to that and uh, look like a good time and, and that, uh, you know, I hope I hope things like that continue to keep happening every year uh, to keep his music going because he was supremely talented. So ridiculous, um, ridiculous and, guitar player, that guy. I mean, just ridiculous. so good. And uh, yeah, I mean, everything he did was it was uh, fantastic. I only had one interaction with him personally, and it was 
uh it was hilarious um that dude was super funny so um yeah well uh i am gonna ask for one check on this caddo parish yep okay cool that's wanna, correct the, the caddo uh, caddo want... indians the caddo natives uh and i know one caddo word and i'm gonna tell you right now it's nyausa there's no way i'm pronouncing that right that's the caddo word for music wow <laughs> nyausa how did you never so mind your cat, your i just I, listeners that's... can can dunk on me i'm sure Hey man, yeah, they'll hop on here. There's uh we have a huge contingency in the uh Caddo Nation. So um good. All right. Well, now that I know I'm pronouncing it right, let's dig into the story. Uh Lead Belly uh and you came up in uh Caddo Parish, uh where uh it's like a county, uh, but uh if Louisiana were part of America. Um, it, it was named after the Caddo Indians, as you suggested, uh, that once claimed the area as their home. In the early 1800s, it was the center of the cotton trade, which of course meant many, many slaves. Uh, even well into the 1900s, uh, in the time of Lead Belly, there were uh, 50 documented lynchings in the county, which uh, seems relatively high for the 1900s and makes Lead Belly's story even more amazing because uh, he was able to skirt the law time and time again. Uh, eventually, the area struck oil, uh, literally, uh, and the economy kind of shifted in the in the mid 1900s and the 20th century, and and has kind of stayed the same uh, to where we are today, with the exception of some uh, casinos and gaming and and different things like that making their way in the area. So, I met my wife in Louisiana. We got married in Louisiana. I go back almost every year since I was about 12. Obviously, more you know New Orleans area and and things like that. Um, I don't have any family there. I don't know why we always, uh, kind of made that our home away from home, but, um, tell me kind of like in your day, you know, before you made it to the, the Commonwealth of Kentucky, um, just what you remember growing up there. Uh, you got family down there, dude. You just don't know it. I mean, we're, we're your family, bud. Y'all just true, quit true coming to the that. barbecue. That's on you. <laughs> uh, Man, I just remember, you know, I, I go down there now and it's it's so blisteringly hot. And I played baseball. I mean, baseball was the thing in that area. Um, and I played baseball through the summer. Dude, are you kidding me? I would die now. There's no way that heat is. Obnoxious. Were you always were you always like a big dude, though? Like when no, you were a kid, were you, the, were you the big guy on the team? No, I was tall. I was always like the tallest kid, but I was kind of tall and, and lanky and, uh, you know, also not athletic. Um but yeah, man, I mean, we went to, uh, so the town I grew up in, it was called Blanchard, didn't have a post office. It's kind of, I guess, a suburb of Shreveport, but, um, you know, a good ways out. And uh, there was nothing. Um, they got a Dollar General now, so they're kind of like crushing it. And they got a pizza Bougie. hut. But this, uh, this is since we left, man, you know. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was where, where did you go then? Like, you know, if you had to... If mom had to buy, you know, a new set of jeans for the school year, like Shreveport. where were you, where were you driving to? Yeah. She Shreveport. drove like 30 minutes away to, to Shreveport. There, there was for real nothing, man. There was a little like corner market. I remember, and we would get these things called Mississippi mud, um, like ice cream sandwiches that were just chronic. And I, I don't know that I've seen them since, um, yeah, they've probably yeah. gone the way of the Choco Taco this year. So, um, yeah. yeah That's over. how you know that, um, the, 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 you know, the American experiment is crumbling. Choco Taco's gone. Oh, 100%. Actually, the market by my house over here on the lake uh, has uh, ch like one box left of Choco Tacos. And I don't think anybody's buying them but me. So I think I'm going to go in there and try to negotiate like a like a bulk deal where I just, you know, buy out the rest of his inventory and hold Put on it to on it. So, yeah, I don't think he knows they're done. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take advantage because I think you can get, I think like a pack of Surge goes for like, four hundred dollars these days come um, on man <laughs> no nah, for real like if you if you can find it um i'm pretty sure those go for like a pretty penny so next it'll be um, pogs pogs will start going for oh man what <laughs> yeah. the who the hell what was that well like i look back and i think on it and i'm like what was that this is indicative like, why of, didn't... of my whole adult life i got i remember getting like the rad slammer right on the summer yeah. Uh, while oh, school God, was out, I got slammer. like the brass slammer and I came back, yeah. bro, and pogs were gone. It was the least yeah. cool thing ever. I was like, no. <laughs> no, I just got, I just finished the collection. Like, ah. Uh. 
We're assuming. I feel our like you could bring him right back now. now, and the kids would like him. But I don't, for the life of me, know what in a you know it was like an eighteen month window where it just was like the hottest thing. And then it was gone. like yo-yos were big again, and like people were walking the dog and Statue of Liberty and all that. And then all of a sudden, like it was Pogs, and then Pogs just was gone. Like you said, by the time you nailed it, yeah, it was over. Nobody called. You know me. what I mean? Yeah. No, I didn't know. Um, plus, you know, where you were, uh, it probably took some time to get there. You know what I mean? Like it, you know, yeah. it, it went, it, it, it was no longer cool in Santa Barbara and Manhattan. And then like eight months later, Justin finds out that pogs are dead. So over in Santa um, Kentucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So where we are now, uh, down towards Shreveport, uh, the county, I'm going to call it a county, even though it's a parish, sorry, uh, that. population 237,000. Uh, in in the parish, forty five percent white, forty eight percent black, one point two percent Asian, point four percent Native American, uh, which it's the namesake. So that those numbers aren't looking great, um, and and point two percent claim other, which is helpful because last episode I told Mike that Texas was the only state that probably had other as an option, um, but no, we have it here. So. Um, I, you know, it's always interesting when you're from the north to see like a population demographic like that. And it's normal in the south. But, you know, to kind of have uh, basically 50 50 black white population is, is so unique um, to the south. And so I don't think a lot of people, you know, even think about that uh, as, you know, you think of the south as, you know, segregated or whatever. But in, in actuality and in reality, these communities are like, you know, relatively small and relatively diverse, you know, compared to the rest Very. of the population. I, it was, it so, was shocking to me, man. I mean, you know, my first grade teacher was black. Half the, half the students were black. My principal was black. And then, um, specifically when I, when we ended up in Cynthia, I mean, man, God, it, it, it maybe 30 black people in the whole County, you know? Wow. Um, and all those cats could fight, dude. <laughs> All those cats could fight because because there, there there was some uh, there was some dumbasses on the other side. Oh, for sure. Um, so I know you know the South moves a little slow, um, but um, you know, did you? What kind of you know were you listening to music when you were down there? I mean, were had you did you not find music until you moved out of there? Like, what was that you know? Because obviously you're you're influenced by your friend group, you're influenced by the people you grew up with, and obviously Kentucky and Louisiana are starkly different. So you know, when did yeah. you start going like, ooh, I, I like music? <laughs> it, uh, you know, like anybody else, I was the oldest kid, so I didn't have like an older sibling to show me the rad stuff, but. Um, my pops was, was big, uh, kind of classic rock. So I, I definitely remember, you know, Tom Petty, Dire Straits, big time, um, growing up and Pink Floyd. And then, uh, my mom was all kind of like Motown, but like, uh, the least dangerous Motown, like Diana Ross yeah. and that kind of thing. Rod um, Stewart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, maybe not even yet, but, uh, <laughs> but I remember vividly my homie, uh, Ryan, who's my best friend down there. And, uh, and he was like, he was like the wilder dude. You know, I was, I was very vanilla and he showed me, uh, guns and roses. Welcome to the jungle. And it was like, Oh, yeah. now we're an good, Indiana man. boy right there. Yeah, man. Yeah. But he got the yeah. hell out, didn't he? <laughs> he did. He did very quickly. Um, <laughs> two of them, right? Yeah. He, it, yeah. Axel and, yeah. Uh, Axel and I forget who there is one more, but I can't. It's definitely not it slash, uh, slash, but I definitely. I don't I can't remember who the other one was. But yeah, it was like Lafayette, Purdue area, I think. Yeah. Um. But yeah, he got up and out for sure. Um. And now he looks like a guy from Indiana again. So <laughs> it all came full circle. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, he looks like a proto Kid Rock now. <laughs> he does. He does. Um. So he looks like like my aunt Debbie and kid rock, like mixed together a little bit. Um, something about that age of rockers all look like a Karen. All of a sudden they like, they want to speak to the manager. Um, That's what the good drugs do. The, the drugs they do. They turn you afford. into your aunt. Yeah. Yes. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, so the median household income is $41,000. The national average is, uh, it's about, uh, you know, quite a bit lower than the national average, but the cost of living is 30% lower. So it really kind of 
balances out. Um, even now, the median home price is, you know, in the mid hundreds to 200. So, I mean, I might have to go buy a little real estate down there um, and flip some rental properties or something because that's pretty good. Um, in recent history, a lot of entertainments moved in, casinos and such, um, you know, attracting a lot of colorful crowds from Arkansas, Texas, and Louisiana. So, it is, you know, you kind of forget that it's like, you know, kind of like Indiana, Ohio, and, you know, Kentucky. Like there's a kind of a little triad there, uh, you know, where you can kind of jump state lines a little bit. But, they call it um, the Arklatex. They got a word for it. The Arklatex. Wow. That's a lot yeah, better than a like forced... Kentuckyana. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a forced word, though. It really is. And especially, I mean, I've met, I had, I know I have family in Arkansas and I don't, that might be too many syllables. I think, I think that's, <laughs> they might need to cut down. Well, and all of them, there. I think all three of them have a Texarkana. I know Louisiana and Texas do. I'm pretty sure Arkansas might too. I'm not sure. Yeah. So you say you play baseball. What else do you do to pass the time? Uh, definitely played baseball and we lived, I mean, not exaggerating. We lived in a trailer at the end of a dead end road. So how do we pass our time? Uh, me and my brother would play, uh, one-on-one -on -one baseball, which is not a thing that you can do. Uh, you know, <laughs> we would, uh, ride dirt bikes and, uh, you know, at least one time, uh, throw glass jars at each other. Um, yeah. so we were kind of those Hell kids, yeah. man, hunting frogs, <laughs> you know, yeah. just being little Yeah, assholes. going gigging, baby. I going like it. Gigging, bud. I remember a kid yeah. down the street had one of those rad slingshots, right? With like the brace. Ooh. And uh, yeah. mama was like, nah. Yeah, you, yeah, you get you some good leverage that. with that brace. It's crazy. Uh, so, I mean, was it pretty like, I mean, were, was everybody kind of just getting by down there at the time? I mean, it seems like, you know, especially now, like there's a lot of, you know, financial disparity. So, I mean, was it kind of like working class crowd type thing? Well, uh I always kind of watch what I say because my dad listens to these things. And, I, you know, my dad is the hardest working, you know, American dad, dude. But the truth is we were pretty damn poor, you know. Um, I didn't see my dad much. He was working 80-hour weeks down there. Um, and the reason we left, I, I, I presume we would still be down there were it not for the Toyota plant they put in uh, Kentucky. But, yeah, man, I mean – I make jokes about it and I think it embarrasses him, but I remember like it was a big deal to go to Taco Bell. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. you, you better order water. <laughs> you better not, yeah, right? You better not try to order a pop, <laughs> which they, yeah. we all, and you might all sneak Coke. a, you might sneak a lemonade or something if the nope. buttons are set up. Oh, right. yeah. You Who do knows? it at the button, right? Yeah. Yeah. Don't, but don't pay for it. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I hear that. Um, so let's go down to famous people that aren't you from the area. Um, can you guess any? I know uh, I'm related to probably the most famous one. Uh, my Let's cousin Josh Stinson uh, was an MLB pitcher uh, for I don't know maybe yeah I remember seasons, yeah ten season. That's my first cousin. Well, we'll cross man. <laughs> we'll cross him off the list. Uh, so clearly he was the the baseball uh, guy in the in the family. Then oh, dude, from the you, jump, so. like there was like from two years old, there was never any doubt. You know, his daddy was pretty good and coached, and no, nah, it was happening, dude. For sure. That All right. Well, you college. also <laughs> you also happen to have golf legend Hal Sutton, yeah. um, who who was born in the area, and Playboy model L. Evans. Um, yeah. A little bit about L. Uh, she was Miss Teen USA. Um, she got caught dining and ditching with her friends and ended up having weed in her purse. Um, so Playboy smelled blood in the water and moved in on her. Um, and she, she was, a uh, a, a pinup girl in Playboy for, for one, uh, one season. And, uh, eventually she appeared in a Robin Thicke Blurred Lines video, um, on the topic of Robin Thicke. Uh, do you ever worry, like when you're writing a song that like you've heard it before? Like, I'm like, so I always wonder for this Robin Thicke conversation. <laughs> yeah. So like right, every so song Every song can basically be traced back to Lead Belly, right? So, Surely. So when you're writing a song, like, do you ever have a moment where you go like, oh, this melody or like that lyric, like, have I heard that before somewhere? Like, do you even worry about it or do you just write and whatever comes out, comes out? Because sometimes I think of that if I'm like writing some kind of joke or something, I'll be like, wait, did I steal that from somebody? Like, is that ever even a concern with songwriters or do you just kind of let it flow and let the chips fall where they fall? 
I don't think it's a concern for many writers, some of which we know. I mean, it, they seem to uh, not give a shit. But what I try to do, man, is like when the tap is on, just finish the song, get the thing done. And then in editing, we can go back. And uh, my homie Adam Lee, one of my best friends, like both of us are pretty good at holding each other accountable on these kinds of things, you know. And it's like, yo, dude, that's absolutely not your line. I'm like, okay, well, I've never heard the other, you know. And it just depends. Yeah. Man, we're all kind of like adding to the patchwork, right? Like not trying to give anybody an excuse, but there's nothing new under the sun. I think it boils down to intent, right? And how how mm -hmm. much you're going over there. I mean, there's there's a, a progression of a song of mine that sounded uh, very similar to uh, to Pink Floyd. And I won't tell you what song, but you can go find it. But, uh, you know, I was telling my producer, he, he's going to hate this too. But I was like, man, we probably need to maybe change the chord here, you know, be careful. He's like, Justin, the best thing that would ever happen to your career is if Pink Floyd sued you. <laughs> Do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Half of nothing's nothing. Let's go. Um, yeah, that's. Come on. that's the way i look at it especially with this podcast i'm like come at me like get my name in the paper i don't care yeah. um but yeah it's um that's interesting because like you know i it's not a question i've asked anybody ever but i thought about it today because it was you know the lead belly line they're like nirvana bob dylan you know so on and so forth and i'm like really nothing's original but like you have to still try to strike an original tone right like you gotta it has to be yours but it probably isn't <laughs> you also, know what i mean like at the end I mean, of the, the day the entirety of american music is on the back of stealing from black people and not crediting them properly so you know yep that's 100 percent true um man you're prepared for this episode uh all right so we typically like to do some talk. town reviews and so uh we typically do town reviews so here's a three-star review I love this because it's three stars. Three stars is a majority of the stars. It's five stars. So three is you're in the upper, like you're passing. It's, so it's a passing grade. But this is what is this is what he wrote. I would not live here again. I went out of Shreveport as soon as I possibly can. That's a three star. That's a one star review. He gave it three stars. Yeah. I don't know if he clicked wrong, but like this guy is like super positive. If that's his three star, like, yeah, I hate it. I want to leave, but. Three stars. Is, is he shitting on Blanche? I mean, so they're shitting on Shreveport. So it's this like, one's, I did the county, so it's going to yeah. have a variety of places. Everybody's from you. a different part of the county. So a five-star oh, okay. review, this one came from more of the suburbs area. The crime doesn't seem, <laughs> I forgot. Oh, no. I forgot how this one, I forgot how this one was written. This is funny. Five stars. Oh, no. The crime doesn't seem to happen in the area, nor polices. So five stars. <laughs> Hey, man, I'm about it, dude. No polices. All right. I am too. No polices, <laughs> no crime. Doesn't happen. Five stars. Goodbye, Four polices. stars. I did all high. I did all three and above for this um, because they were bad still. I don't know. Four stars. It's not any worse. Than <laughs> I forgot about this one too. Four stars. It's not any worse than where I used to live. Bruh. Four stars. What, what Four was stars. The, what, is the, what is the literacy rate? Did you say that earlier? Uh, at the top of the pot? <laughs> I don't know. The unemployment rate's like three times higher. So, yeah. you know. It, I, well, these but, cats are all the ones it, writing the reviews. <laughs> 100%. But, like, what I love about them, grammar aside, because, like, we all have sure. a different lexicon, but grammar aside, four stars, it's not any worse than where I used to live. Like, that's. <laughs> Not four, four stars is like I love the coffee shop. The parks are really nice. The public schools are good. No police, you know, whatever. But like, it's not any worse than you know where I was yesterday. Uh, four stars. So anyway, line. love, love the positivity coming out of the county. So or parish. Fuck, I'm gonna get, get it. it right. Sorry, I'm gonna get you saying Louisiana right by the time this is over. We'll see. We'll see. I, I still try to get people to say Louisville right, and that takes oh, uh, a lot of. I hear eight different things. It's never Louisville. So yeah. Um, so what's Justin's rating? Uh, have you have you been back much? Like either through touring or like you just go back and visit. Like have you been through the area very much over the years? Yeah, very much, man. Like like most of my family is there. Uh, my grandparents have all passed in the last uh, four years. Um, so we were down there a lot more then, but you know, aunts, uncles, almost everybody is down there. Um, and I'll be down there in about a month. Uh, but yeah, man, like, you know, I don't want to be disparaging. Uh, I, I don't know that I would raise my kids where I grew up, you know? Um, 
I don't know that I would have much success. Uh, I don't know what the music thing is over in Northwest Louisiana, but you know, I, having said that, that is like the birthplace of so much American music, man. And, and it's kind mm -hmm. of interesting. I'm not trying to like attach any sort of real importance to those reviews you were saying, but you know, there's something to be said about people down in the Delta in that heat and that misery and, and all that, uh, kind of friction socially in that time, you know, writing these beautiful songs. I mean, I, I think that mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff comes from struggle and pain and it's hard to beat struggle of black people in a Delta, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't get good music sitting in a office, you know, on the top floor, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's not in any way inspiring <laughs> to, to, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it is what it is. Do you think Andy Bashir would pardon you um, if it was like a misdemeanor? Andy Bashir would uh, pardon me immediately. Yes. Uh, All right. Cool. It's the dimple. I just wanted to have would. that. Yeah. That's good. If I just smile. All right. I'm uh, good, bud. All right. Well, you might have to write a song because that's what Lead Belly did. All right. Now it's time to put that to bed and get into today's tale. So giddy up, motherfuckers. All right. Pause, interlude, music. All right, here we go. Get ready for the story. <clears throat> Hoodie Ledbetter, otherwise known as Leadbelly, is an icon whose innovative style changed the way people played and thought about blues and folk tunes. By the time of his death, he had lived uh, up to the name that he gave himself, which was the king of the 12 string. His dis discography is only outdone by his crimes. Uh, in a time when lynchings were still a thing, uh, he was so good at guitar that he actually got pardoned multiple times uh it's hard to tell uh when lead belly was actually born because uh there's some discrepancies with the census but uh most people can kind of say it was probably january 20th uh 1888 um either way it's late 1800s and his parents sally brown and wesley ledbetter uh raised him in mooringsport louisiana did i pronounce that one right yep yes all right cool According to the Blues Encyclopedia, uh, Leadbelly had a pretty decent upbringing for the time, uh, but he still dropped out of school at the age of 12. Uh, at this point, his family relocated to Texas, and uh, soon after, he was living next to his parents uh, in Bowie County with his wife, Aletha Henderson. Um, at this stage, uh, Hoodie had already been introduced to music through his uncle, Tyrell, who gave him an accordion. Uh, but later was credited with also introducing him to the guitar and teaching him the basics. Uh, so I assume your first instrument wasn't the accordion, but, you know, kind of where did you finally, like, pick up an instrument and decide, all right, I'm going to give this a shot? That was up here. That was in Kentucky, like, junior high. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Picked up a guitar. Uh, really, the homies were all doing it, you know. Um, and they were going real metal, and I was going – uh, real love songs that I was never going to let anybody hear <laughs> in, my, in yeah. my room. You know what I mean? Oh, or heartbreak sweet songs, Justin. I guess. Oh, dude. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that's sweet. I love. Dude, I bet you wrote love notes and stuff, too. You need to do a bit sometime where you have songwriters uh, tell you the titles of their earliest songs they can remember because they will lie. They'll all lie, all of them. Yeah, I need to do that. All right, adding that to the list for the quick draw questions at the end. Um, oh God. All right. Well, uh, Lead Belly uh, doesn't really credit his uncle with making him the musician he was, but instead it came from a sort of cocktail of, uh, you know, defining moments throughout his timeline. Uh, it was pretty messy with a lot of different experiences and traveling. Um, and, you know, he kind of patched it all together into some interesting music into his 30s and 40s. Um, Start off his early career, Leadbelly often performed at a place called St. Paul's Bottoms, uh, which was a notorious red light district in Louisiana. Um, that introduced Leadbelly to the saloons, the brothel, brothels, the dance halls, uh, playing an array of different music uh, that would eventually help him open his mind up to kind of his own particular sound. Uh, where were kind of like the first, you know, haunts that you decided, all right, I'm going to take this, take this on the road and see if anybody will pay me to do it? Oh, man, uh, you know, would love to Lana's Pub in Lexington, which was kind of like this Irish pub. They just closed, man. They got some legal shit, at, you know, like the fourth owner. But uh, just this place over by campus, and it was, uh, you know, perfect dive. Not a not a venue, man. Um, 
but we kind of learned how to be a band there in a place called the Dragon or the Dragon Pub in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, yeah, we they 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 would pay you next to nothing, but they'd give you a free bar tab. And our first show there, they said uh, we are only doing fifty percent off going forward, and that applied wow. to all bands. So we ruined it. Damn, for you, you Frankfurters. Damn, end up losing money. That's no good. Uh, yeah, that's that's tough, man. Um, but you us. know what? Being a, I'm on the venue. I've been on the venue side. That side's tough too. That's what I feel like. A lot of it gets sure. lost in the lost in the minutia that like you know uh like with you know bj recently kind of going off with the uh 20 of merch and we don't yeah. re- i had never really kept merch you know that was never you know part of our deals really but i also understand venues that have to and so it's you know i it's there's always two sides right and so i think if you're not live nation and you're not ticket master you're probably you know, at some point struggling. <laughs> well, that's the <laughs> tricky this, thing. And like, you know, BJ's a homie and, and I love what he's doing and it, and it trickles down to guys down here like me. Uh, but the only ones that are going to acquiesce probably, and you can probably attest to this more than I can, are the good ones, the ones that are on yeah. our side. It's not going to be the the live nations and the ticket. They don't give a shit, you know? Yeah. They'll tell you to get lost. Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, we maybe a few you know early on we did but you know as we kind of got established like we quit doing it you know and i yeah. think that's the natural kind of progression of things is you know once you have your footing you try to pass it on to somebody else you know i think that's for artists too like you know picking the right openers to take on the road with you and things like that um you know it just all trickles down so um and nobody's a harder working guy than bj i don't think in this industry so that's um, facts and you yeah. know man the, you can tie this back to our subject i mean you know to, to my understanding, the music business as we know it now was built on the backs of uh, educated people taking advantage of people like Lead Belly and getting them to sign yep. away everything. And and nothing's really changed. Not really. I mean, you know, some things are better and some things are worse, but it's all uh, guys like us and gals like us just trying to scrap together, you know, and, and do the thing. And venues, obviously, yep. too. It's but it's getting easier, I feel like, you know, I mean, it doesn't seem like it, but slowly but surely we're seeing homies in places that, you know, we probably never thought <laughs> we would. So uh, hopefully we're, we're turning a corner there. So uh, back to Lead Belly. Uh, he started playing with an artist known as Blind Lemon Jefferson, which is the tightest name anybody's ever had. I would love to see it. It sounds like an early 90s, um, you know, kind of like emo uh, soft rock band. Um, so Blind Lemon Jefferson uh, took him around through Texas, uh, helped him improve his skill set on guitar. Um, he was uh, Jefferson was an intricate player. Uh, he didn't follow conventional norms for blues, and you can really see that uh, in a lot of Lead Belly's music later on. Um, and at some point in the early 1900s, Lead Belly began to use a 12-string guitar instead of the traditional six-string guitar. Um, this allegedly came from Lead Belly witnessing a Mexican musician using the instrument, uh, and since then it became kind of the forte uh, and a staple in his music. Uh, it was clear by the time Lead Belly was working on becoming a well-rounded, unique musician, and by his early 20s, uh, he left his home and his family. Uh, he had two children at the time, and he uh, took off, and uh, he even he's still married, still you know trying to support him, but... Uh, he took off on the road, um, and all he cared about was travel in America and, and taking his music out on the road. So when did you reach a point where it wasn't kind of the, the little roundabout locally and, you know, finally decide, all right, we're going to go, we're going to go here, we're going to go there and maybe try to turn this into a tour at some point, you know, what, what, uh, cause I mean, you guys achieve success, you know, over a short period of time, um, you know, pretty quickly on that first go around. So like when, when did you decide you were going to actually go out on the road? Immediately. Uh, you know, I, I think that we, I was joking earlier, but kind of not, I mean, I'll do a thing wrong 10 times before I get it right. And it's, it's really always been that way. And it's, it's probably my knucklehead approach, but it's also that kind of DIY thing. I mean, if I'd been in, you know, any city, I would have been a punk kid. There wasn't really mm-hmm. punks where I grew up. Um, but we just hit the road immediately, man. I mean, dating myself again, but, you know, we got on MySpace and just hollered at people in areas, and we went on tour. Dude, if you would have given us $100 and and definitely a place to stay, 
uh, we're there, man. We're playing your pizza joint, and and we really cut our teeth. We were touring long before we had an agent, long before we had a manager. Um, and I think people now, uh, at least outside of you know maybe this area, are aware of about two years of Fifth on the Floor. But we were a band for nine years, man. We put out four albums, so it just goes to show how long it took for anybody to pay attention. And Kentucky wasn't a genre back then yeah you know, there was now no it is jesus here. christ i know yeah yeah it's uh it's funny how like i look at it geographically and i'm like well indiana's right here ohio's right here and kentucky's just its own behemoth you know you know what i mean like it's like uh it's just like 30 miles made all the difference it's uh yeah it's unbelievable i think there's a shared uh, darkness man and this might just be me projecting this onto it but you know louisiana it's it's like i want to think it's like the heat it's like maybe the the you know the racial tension uh, of mm-hmm. a century and a half ago, um, et cetera. In Kentucky, I think it's it's less the racial tension, but it's but it is absolutely a, a, a monetary tension. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's an economic disparity. Like you got yes. the you got the Churchill Downs crowd, and then you got the coal mining crowd, and it's all you know. You have horse uh, owners and people that work on the horses. <laughs> you know, no matter what area of kentucky you pick there's kind of a class system in place almost you you'd be i mean in my experience you'd be hard pressed to to find i mean super sweet people beautiful people um good people but uh appalachian like true appalachian folks they're not trustful nor should they be they've been given no reason to 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 trust outsiders and so you know Mm -hmm. yeah it's an insulary community you know what i mean no matter i mean aside from anything else like it's just geographically (laughs) you know what i mean like if you're up on a hillside you're not really part of the you know the greater community as a whole you know broadband's not uh you know connecting you in a way that it you know you're 10 years behind everything and so it's you know and i'm from close to you know i'm from madison so you know we we call it mad tucky you know so i'm not you know too far from the area and and it's uh you know definitely an insular area i didn't know Indiana was flat until I was like 20, honestly. Um, (laughs) I had no idea. I didn't know about like north of Indianapolis. I just knew where I was from, which was, you know, a little town in the hills. And so um, I definitely, you know, associate a lot more of my childhood thinking, you know, more Kentucky related than I do, you know, Indiana. So, um, yeah. So our guy here, uh, early 1910s, uh, he traveled the railroad just walking uh and he would stop and pick cotton at different farms and plantations along the way um he played his music to whoever would listen pop just like you said popping into dives and anybody that would pay him or give him a hot plate of food um he was described as a very hard worker even better musician on the stage um he seemed to be heading in the right direction but then in 1910s sometime in the early um he had some pretty bizarre things happen that changed the course of his life so um did you ever have any odd jobs like before you got in or even during music uh where you were just trying to make ends meet uh yeah i mean my first job was working tobacco and that sucked um and i I, i'd be happy it doesn't suck as much as uh picking cotton from what i've heard my great grandmother granny willie picked cotton uh i screw that bud um but yeah, I mean, I briefly shoveled shit on a horse farm. That sucked. Uh, I worked over a summer. Did you just try to pick railroad. the worst jobs? Or Listen, are you? I, I, I think you're missing the theme here, man. <laughs> no, I, will go, I, 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 will go I, I the think wrong I get rate. it. I'm just. Yeah, no, I get it. It's just like those are like those are the two jobs I would have like um, stereotypically threw out is like, Hey, did you have those jobs? <laughs> and, yeah. And you were like, but I yeah, wasn't, like, I wasn't like a country kid either, man. I mean, I grew up in the country, right. But like my people weren't farmers, you know, my dad's a mechanic. And uh, so I just yeah. like would end up in those situations. Um, I don't know. I mean, like I waited tables and people shit on waiting tables. Waiting tables was like the raddest job I ever had. Like, yeah. hundred percent. You know, the other, yeah, it was you know, air conditioning. Stuff. I mean, yeah yeah man you make well you'd always rather be on the digestive scale you always would rather be closer to the food than the shit so like (laughs) you know you're already moving up in the world for 100 percent. so yeah uh in 1915 uh lead belly was arrested for possessing possessing a pistol and assault in texas and was subsequently sent to work uh work it off on the harrison county chain gang for 30 days 
Um, I really do think like a few southern states still have chain gangs, maybe Georgia. Um, really? That just blows my... Yeah, I think Georgia still has chain gangs. I would have to Google it, but I'm, I'm like 99% sure. That's yeah. insane. Yeah, they... It's... Uh, I mean, I understand work. Like, I get that because, like, you know, you owe, you owe a debt to society. You might as well be stamping license plates or, like, doing something for the, you know, for the state. You know, that's fine. But and maybe get some sort of penance for it as far as uh, time off or, or money. Yeah. But, yeah, chaining people up and, like, that just doesn't seem safe. So, um, so yeah, that uh, um, – so, you know, I'm looking at it thinking – you know chain gang uh, he's probably going to escape right like that seems like the next uh natural progression so it didn't last long um a couple days uh with the chain gang he did escape um he outran the officers and their dogs um after that he stayed in texas and used the fake name walter boyd uh which he used uh to find work and and just kind of like avoid avoid i love the name too it's so blase like it's perfect yeah, no one's gonna straight think vanilla <laughs> yeah he's like who's the whitest guy i ever met uh walter oh, boyd walter. got it yeah so walter never did anything to anybody um uh, a few a few years he used that name but then in december 1917 he found himself in some serious trouble when he shot and killed uh, one of his relatives, uh, Will Stafford, over a woman. Uh, it looked like Lead Belly would be spending the rest of his life in prison, or at very least, he wouldn't be getting out for a few decades. Uh, but he figured out the system, and he figured out how to work the system. Uh, he would sing to the prisoners and the guards, and generally stayed under the radar and didn't violate any of the prison rules. Do you think you'd be a model inmate? Do you think like you would uh, would you be the lead belly in this case or do you think uh, I think people would try you? You know, what I mean, I think I think day one, Justin walks in, people are going to try him. Yeah. From my experience in honky tonks, I think you're probably right. I probably bury in the lead. I've, I've been to jail in Louisiana uh, and I was overnight and I was like, this is not for me. This <laughs> this this is also uh, not for me. Uh yeah, no, man. I tried to sleep, and and my uh, cellmate was like, "Hey, dude, it's it's light, it's lights on, like you can't sleep." I was like, "But I've not been to sleep." It's like that doesn't don't matter. matter. Don't matter. Yeah, this isn't your time, buddy. Oh no. man. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think I, I would. I would try to be model. I would try to charm. You know, you do that. You know what I mean? Like you're a you're I a charmer by nature. Yeah, well, I think he could you could do, but I think you know you're you're a product of the circumstances, and and I don't think people would. Uh, you'd have to pick a side. I think I don't. I don't. They people would want you on their team. So um, I think you know you would definitely have to pick a side. Uh, so Lead Belly, uh, he found himself in a pretty serious situation when another prisoner uh, stabbed him in the neck. Uh, so he almost killed the guy, uh, but neither one of them ended up dying, and they both survived the attack. Uh, it left him with a nasty scar on his neck that he'd cover up with a bandana. So for the rest of his life, that's a really like whenever you see pictures or video of him, he has this bandana on. It's kind of his look and his aesthetic. And it actually came from being stabbed in the neck in prison. Um, so, yeah, uh, that really started adding to kind of his dangerous image. Uh, you know, people started to know him a little, as much for violence as they did for music. Um, and but his his image in prison was fairly clean and he used it to his advantage. So. Uh, he asked uh, for his freedom by writing a song to Pat Morris Neff, the governor of Texas. At the time, Neff had strong principles and actually stated in his reelection campaign that there was no way he would ever pardon anybody uh, during his tenure as governor. But uh, Lead Belly seemed to be the exception. What song would you send the governor that you've written um, to try to get out of jail? What's your get out of jail free song? The governor in which state, Louisiana or Kentucky? Let's do. So we're in Louisiana. Let's let's stay in Louisiana. I wrote it. I started writing a song called January in Louisiana. Uh, went uh, in my hold overnight. on to it. Hold on. To <laughs> no, it. I mean it's. It, I put it out. That was a fifth on the floor song. Uh, but that that started. Um, I don't know that I would send that though. It it, it turned into fiction about a guy getting killed. So maybe that wouldn't be mm. one to send. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe one Touché. of those love songs from high school. Yeah, send him that. Uh, that. I think that's the direction he took. So I think he pulled on the heartstrings um, and it seemed to work. So 
between the song good behavior and the fact that he had served seven years on a sentence already i mean that's not seven years gone like out of the prime of his you know touring and everything else just out the door um and so he had served the minimum amount of time of the sentence the governor decided to issue a pardon in 1925 and lead belly was a free man uh, this freedom lasted around five years, uh, and in this time, Lead Belly essentially continued what he'd already been doing, picking up odd jobs, uh, playing music in his free time wherever he could. Uh, however, um, if you haven't figured out by now, Lead Belly's uh, always into some shit and typically drunk, um, and he had quite a temper. So, um, you know, as an alcoholic and somebody with short fuse, um, it sent him down a pretty dangerous road, and unfortunately, he ended up finding himself back in prison in 1930. This time, for attempted murder, uh, after he got into another fight, his temper and alcoholism yet again led him into prison, and it wasn't looking like Lead Belly was uh, going to be able to get out of this one. Uh, after meeting Lead Belly in 1924, following his first pardon, Neff actually returned to jail uh, several times in this, in this uh, go-around um, when he was incarcerated and brought guests with him on Sundays, and Ledbetter would perform uh, for, for the governor and his guests. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely bananas. Um, so before we get into this next part, did you ever have any kind of shepherding through the business side of things? Uh, I mean, you got into it so young, um, you know, th this next part's really going to lean heavily on that, that, you know, he kind of had a shepherd and a mentor, um, you know, who was that for you? Or, you know, I assume by now, you know, you have that trusted core group of people that are, you know, looking out for your best interest. Uh, really shooter, man. But that was... <clears throat> That was years later, you know, it was about six or seven years into being a band that we kind of struck up a, a friendship with Shooter Jennings and, um, and I, that, that was really when people started knowing who my band was, was, uh, he was rattling the cage, you know, um, he's good no about big brothers that. really. Yeah. He's, he's the, he's kind of the best about that, man. Um, but nobody, you know, there wasn't anybody. Again, I really just can't say it enough. I, I think we were just so dumb, man. And, and so, like, we're going to manifest this. We're going to do this until people show up. And we really took that route. There was no, you know, I mean, MySpace existed and, and Facebook. But there wasn't, like, you know, YouTube wasn't even quite happening yet, right? Like, so there yeah. wasn't. We were Spotify, still kind of like, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, like getting getting your music out there was almost exclusively live, man, or like mailing people CDs or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we wasted a lot of time, but uh, but we also learned uh, a couple of good habits and mostly bad habits. That's good. Yeah, I uh, so sh Shooter, I re I watched The Punisher recently, uh, the Netflix series, and uh, Shooter's so in like a couple episodes, and I had totally yeah. forgotten about that, and I was like. Uh, the one time, one of the times I'd met Shooter, uh, he was off the tour bus and he was having a cigarette, but it was by my truck and he was leaned up against my driver door, but he's so short. I didn't see him until I was like putting the key in my door and we both looked up and saw each other and we were like nose to nose and he jumped five feet off the ground and I scared the absolute shit out of him. And that's like <laughs> the only, that's the only time I met Shooter. So um, he's the best, I mean, he scared man. the shit out of me. I thought like Charlie Manson was like, you know, standing by my truck smoking a cigarette. So, um, yeah, it wasn't a cigarette. but yeah, no, that's, uh, it was one of them wacky tobacco cigarettes. Um, so yeah, uh, this time, like I said, uh, he's in jail for attempted murder. Um, but he had to strike a good fortune once again. He met somebody while he was in prison that would change his life literally forever. Uh, the early 1930s, you know, peak of the Depression, United States unemployment was insane. Um, you know, Hitler starting to pop off. Uh, you know, it was it was a wild time. Um, I think around 20 percent of all Americans were unemployed at the time or losing their jobs, which is just absolutely terrifying. Um, one man who had pretty much lost everything was John Lomax. Uh, not only did he lose his job at a bank, uh, but his wife passed away and he was just like, you know, this sucks. What am I going to do? Uh, he went into a deep depression, and then his oldest son, Alan, came up and was like, hey, you like music. How about we just tour America and look for folk songs? Um, and they were like, yeah, let's do it. So they hopped in a car, and like that's what they decided to do was go just find folk songs. And when you think about you know the advent of the radio is finally you know, popular, but recording music and like getting it laid out like you know on on a record or anything else and like even a radio station they needed 
a record, <laughs> you know, to be able to mm-hmm. play it. So it was like almost impossible to like hear this music. And if you think about how much music was being created in these places, you know, and in the hills and in the hollers and in the middle of nowhere in Louisiana and Texas and, and, you know, without a guy like this that just was depressed and hopped in his car, like we would have never heard any of it. Um, so it was was interesting. Um, his goal was to make an anthology of music that he found and go from town to town searching for underground artists, uh, African-American folk musicians, um, that wouldn't be given a platform, you know, in, uh, Los Angeles or Nashville or wherever. Um, you can probably guess where all of it's going. Uh, eventually he found his way to a prison in Louisiana and there's lead belly, uh, and he's there playing music. Uh, so they brought in recording equipment and recorded literally hundreds of songs in the jail uh, with Lead Belly. Um, so this was the first time he'd ever actually been recorded properly. Um, and that's baffling because he was by now in his early 40s. So he's basically our age um, and and laying down his first tracks. <laughs> so yeah, there's that's hope. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, and so I think Samuel L. Jackson was like 46 before he like uh, got his first acting gig. So um, yeah, there's always hope, man. Yeah. Um, so you're looking at your 40s now. Um, you know, we all are. Um, you know, I'm not far behind you. You know, have you, has your perspective shifted now to where the songs are different, the feelings are different, the writing's different. Um, you know, what's, what's, you know, I, I feel it, you know, as a dad and, you know, a husband and, and just being of a certain age, I just like I, my perspective shifts. So I'm wondering, you know, how does that affect kind of the songwriting and just the whole experience for you? Yeah. I mean, you just nailed it, man. I mean, being a dad is the big one. I, I think my career, any of it that anybody knows really started when we had kids, because then it was like, Yo, that hundred dollars in a place to crash in a free bar tab. That ain't that ain't feeding these babies, dude. You gotta get to it. Um so yeah, my perspective has shifted in terms of what I value. Uh I think that I have become angrier <laughs> uh when pen is hitting paper, but I think that I am better, if you want to use that word, at, at kind of masking that. Um I, I don't know. Some of it feels sharper to me in terms of kind of that rah rah anger or whatever but uh, you know i think think it's because the stakes are higher you know what i mean like that's yeah maybe when i was younger it was like water off a duck's back you know what i mean like it was like i didn't really feel it like i feel it now because now it's like it's not just me it's not just you know there's people that rely on me there's the stakes are higher so when something's unjust or you know not the way i think it should be like it pisses me off a little bit more yeah, man, I got a song for you on the new one. Then it's going to be for you. I, I don't know. I, I think it's. I just think it's kind of that uh, that punk thing that we were talking about earlier. I, I could not most of my life know less about punk music, but uh, I certainly was like instantly attracted to that kind of you know truth to power. And I mean, this is kind of blues as well in a way, although they would use metaphor. Sure. But you know, I, I don't know. I, I, go along to get along is not my jam, dude. <laughs> No, no, no. You don't say. Yeah, no, there's, it's... <laughs> I feel you. There's just yeah. too much wrong to be singing about all the right, you know? Yeah, but like you said, you do a good job of masking it. Like, uh, if I didn't know the lyrics, I'd be like, oh, this is a sweet song. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but but I know the words, and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 That's that cuts, that cuts. Um, so, yeah, Lomax, our guy, uh, was so impressed that he uh, actually took on a petition um and uh got lead belly uh to record a song for louisiana governor oscar k allen requesting that lead belly be released again um and soon after his request was made uh lead belly was actually released uh but the governor painted over it a little bit by saying that uh, it was simply because of good behavior and budget cuts uh however uh lead belly hadn't even served the minimum sentence yet and uh, both he and Lomax believe that the recording that they sent to the governor was definitely the reason they let him out of jail for the second time. So that was a seven year one. This is this is because I know he he got to stab in like three or four times. Right. Yeah. So the last bit was seven year. The first bit was seven. Um, he okay, did seven yeah. for that. He did. He was supposed to have life for this one um, or a minimum of like 10. Um, but yeah, they they let him out again um so so yeah we're, he's we're making jokes but 
we got to underline that this is a black man in what the 30s yeah i mean in the 20s in the and the south. 30s in the south that wouldn't happen in the Come 60s on, man no that wouldn't happen i mean in the 60s they were shooting people you know what i mean yeah. like that yes. like uh, i mean it, it, it is i think it's it certainly speaks to his talent. I think it's got to speak to his charm. You know, it's got oh, yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds he like changed. if he wasn't drunk, like that none of this probably would have happened anyway. Because when he wasn't drunk, he was a hard worker. He was a good musician. Like he was making people happy. Sounds like the drink just, you know, got him a, a few times. And unfortunately, it was very stabby and shooty. Uh, well, gotta, you know, there was a weapon. Be drinking. I, I mean, he had to change his name from the raddest name of all time. Huddy yeah. Ledbetter to to what'd you say like Jim Bob yeah like yeah <laughs> no Bob it was Earl. very like yeah it was it wasn't good Walter that was it was yeah. Walter yeah Walter um yeah so not, so, yeah. not very but he's, stabby no but uh, he's out uh and and hitting the road again so um out of prison uh he teams up with Lomax um knowing nobody was really gonna hire him as a, a two time convicted murderer um he asked uh, to join John. Uh, and John said, all right, you can be my driver. So he literally becomes the driver of the guy while they go around and look for more folk music. So for three months, he travels around hearing all this music of other people, taking in all the influence and, and getting better at his craft. Um, and keep in mind, he's, you know, in the roughly the, in his 40s now. So, I mean, this is amazing. Uh, basically, this helped uh, Lead Belly lead him more, uh, learn more about music and being somebody as knowledgeable as John Lomax uh, was definitely beneficial to his music career. In December 1934, Lead Belly participated in a group sing at a college where Lomax was doing a lecture. And uh, there were many members of the press there for the lecture. And they all wrote these sensationalist articles about uh, this performing convict and this guy who sung his way out of prison. Um, and a lot of them weren't the most flattering depictions of uh, Lead Belly, but um, he got quite a bit of recognition off of it. And, you know, that kind of surged the interest and, and got him uh, off the ground. And Lomax eventually became his manager. Um, through a friend, uh, he managed to get Lead Belly signed to Arc Records. And in January 1934, they recorded a handful of songs. Um, and the recordings uh, were released uh, with a promotional tour, including interviews, write-ups, articles. But unfortunately, again, all the articles focused a lot on his prison time and his bad behavior um, instead of these amazing uh, songs. And the record, this is crazy because even back then, they wanted him. They were like, you're black. These are blues songs. His folk songs were infinitely better, and they're the ones that kind of live on to this day, but they wanted him doing blues standards. And so those are the songs they ended up releasing. So, like, even back in the day, you know, Nashville found a way to fuck it up. So um, it's just like the more things change, the more they stay the same, I think. Yeah, truly. Well, Lomax is one of those guys, you know, earlier when I was talking about how I feel like the industry was built on the, the back of exploitation. Maybe I don't have the whole story, but... I think he was one of the guys that, that has not been maybe painted in a good light. Uh, but the way you're telling it, maybe we wouldn't have ever heard Lead Belly. So sometimes it's like, you know, the devil, you know. Yeah, I mean, you have to look know. at the context of the time and go like, it's not good for now, but it's pretty good for then, right? Like, I mean, right. you know, he he gave the guy a chance. And even if it was somewhat, you know, exploitative, it was at least a chance, you know, uh, that a lot of other white men probably weren't going to give them so uh sure. you know it's it's just i always tell people you know don't judge people on what they did but like look at it in the context of where they live what they grew up in the time you know you sure. have to kind of take it all into account but um yeah uh so another reason um you know that uh things weren't really going well was uh you know his race obviously his background um, but his music was so good, a lot of people just had to kind of suck it up and, and get past it. But this was crazy. A Life magazine ran a three-page article called Lead Belly, Bad N-Word Makes Good Minstrel. And that was in 1937. Like that, I was like, that's Life magazine. Like they, I mean, you know how people collect Life magazines? Like I'd love to like see that copy in somebody's collection where they're like, oh shit, sorry. Yeah, I didn't uh, fucking know life was life went hard like that <laughs> in the south so cringe, but, man. Uh, i mean like i hate to say it but I, I don't even know that i mean it may not have even been offensive then I'm at sure. the time I mean, yeah no well I, let me let me clarify 
to white people. It was to certainly white people, offensive yeah. to black people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. But yeah, I was just yeah. like, I read that, and I was like, that wasn't in like the the Alabama Herald. Like that was in you know, <laughs> yeah, New York Life magazine. You know, on the cover, I was like, that's that's insane. Um, and in a time well, when like our grandparents were alive, like that's the crazy yeah. part. It was like. Not that long ago. Um, it's also yeah, a good so. reminder that that the 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 South doesn't uh, you know racism own is racism to the South. Right, right. Racism. Yeah. No, is, Indiana uh, has more Confederate problem. flags per capita than probably any. You know, I'm like, you do realize we were abolitionists in the war, right? Like you're rooting for the wrong team. Like I was like, this is. This is strange. Uh um, well, yeah, I saw yeah, a rebel Indiana. flag in, in northern Maine when I was up there this summer. I'm like, bro, <laughs> what that's what are you doing? You're I the don't Northest. understand. <laughs> no, you're so far away. And I'm always yeah. I always like it when I see those memes that are like the Confederacy uh you know lasted like uh like oh, you yeah. know, not even not as, long as long as, as like Tamagotchi flag. or like you know, they're just like they're like, I know it's a huge part of history, but like the McRib was around longer, or like you know, whatever. So, well, this is yeah, something it's... I love about guys like BJ and and also like a deem the artist is uh, oh, so it, it's something that I that I've struggled with too. Is you know, I'm proud to be from the South. I am a proud Southerner, but there is a yep. ton of things that none of us should be proud of. None of us are proud of. It doesn't mean we got to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, that's that's. That's the birth of American music down there, man. Um, you know, I, but 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 you can't ignore it either. And I think that yep. that's what some some artists are really starting to speak towards is you know a better South, man. You know, man, Adim's so good. I just like when you oh, mentioned him, goodness. I like got a little like chill up my spine. I was like, that guy can write a song, man. Like he is. They they put out. They uh, are. As they're good un- a unbelievable. Yes. True. Yeah, I. Uh, it almost makes me mad. I'm like, you know, they write so well. I do. I I couldn't even think to to put words uh, together like that. And they're so simple. Like the melodies, everything's so simple, and it's so good. Well, what a team <laughs> is just... doing is sitting there and kind of writing like the best country songs, and and th- that's that's indicative of what I'm talking about. Is like, it's not an outsider. It may feel like an outsider because maybe you're uncomfortable with some things that Adim represents. Uh, but Adim is still a badass Southerner and is outriding your favorite country artists. You know. Yep. So hundred percent. Kind of got to reckon with that. It's not just uh, playing some quote unquote Yankee music trying to talk down to you. Like, yeah, got to reckon with that. Yeah. Yeah. It was it. one of my favorite things to like uh, play them for my dad and then. And then be like, "Hi, you like it, don't you?" And then be like, yeah. "All right, here's the artist." And being like, oh, you know, hey, yeah. yeah, just like pulling the uh, tablecloth off and being like, "Here, yeah, here you go." Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just great to see uh, this kind of subgenre accept, be more accepting, and just be more open to different different voices. And and just like even ten years ago, like that wasn't the case, and so I just you know right. everything seems to be trending upward, as negative as you and I uh, might be most of the time. So, um, I think you're right. so our guy he made a little money touring. He's in his forties. Uh, he came to an abrupt end in 1935 when John Lomax decided that he could not work with Lead Belly anymore. Uh, the reason being is alcoholism. He said, um, and uh, Lead Belly's new wife uh, Martha. Um, wanted some money, uh, but you know, the money was thin. And so things were pretty tumultuous. Um, basically Lomax said, Hey, I'm going to buy your house, but I'm going to pay you in installments. And that's going to be like the pay from the tour. And the reason he wanted to do that was because he thought if he gave him all the money because of his alcoholism, he would end up spending all of it at one time. And so Mm -hmm. they had huge contention. Uh, you know, they were, they were super mad about it. They went to court over it, I believe. Um, and he sued Lomax for the amount that he was owed. Um, this lawsuit was the death of their partnership. Uh, they had a very, uh, you know, tense relationship after that and eventually quit talking and, and wouldn't talk again, actually. Um, and so they never worked together again. Lead Belly did reach out one final time, suggesting that they mend fences and get together. Um, but Lomax, uh, never got back to him. So, so that, that relationship ended. Um, when you guys went through the breakup, uh, you know, did you ever think at, at that moment, like, this is it, like, I'm done? Uh, 
Ever so briefly, yeah, I sure did. Because of the kids thing, right? Like, uh, I put all my eggs in that basket, and then that basket was gone. Um, it was it was nearly as abrupt for me as it kind of was for, for you listeners. Um, and we had kids. And, uh, you know, I've told this story on the mic, but, you know, it's it's such a testament to my wife. It, you know, I went to her, I'm like, you know, I guess I go try to get a job at Toyota. You know, that's that dad can maybe get me in if I wait a month and, and have clean piss, and, <laughs> you know, and she's like, and she literally said, if you quit, you're teaching our daughters how to quit. And <laughs> man, Ooh. the gaunt, the gauntlet is thrown. like, what, what <sighs> other response could I have other than to try my damnedest at this thing, man. And, and so I just, that first record was really just me kind of reflecting on that breakup and kind of struggling with it and focusing on what mattered. And, uh, and yeah. Damn. Yeah, that's wild. Um, She's well, now we're all the way we're all the way up to 1939. Now, um, Lead Belly went to prison one final time. He wasn't done yet. So this time, uh, while in prison, Alan Lomax, John's son, decided to help Lead Belly uh, with his legal fees and later his music career. Uh, Alan had a show on CBS with director Nicholas Ray called uh, "Back Where I Come From." Lead Belly became a regular on the show. Uh, which helped propel his name and, you know, the New York folk scene at the time, which was really big, um, which was on the rise in the early 40s. Lead Belly signed with Capitol Records and ended up moving out to California. Uh, The end result was some of the best Lead Belly records that we have now from 1944 to 1948. He recorded songs like Irene, Backwater Blues, Where Did You Sleep Last Night, Uh, you know, all the ones that we know and love today. Uh, Some of the singles were compiled to make an album, Midnight Special, which is uh, not only uh, now considered to be an iconic folk album, uh, but it was also important because it's the last Lead Belly album that was released uh, while he was still alive. Uh, Soon after all this, he died of Lou Gehrig's disease, which I feel like Lou Gehrig was like getting Lou Gehrig's disease at this time. So they could have easily called it Lead Belly disease, which I think sounds more like a disease. So I think... I think we missed a huge rebrand opportunity uh, with him getting this. But uh, in theory, uh, 1949 was Lead Belly's most successful year. Uh, he had his own radio show called Folk Songs of America, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, he was continuing to do shows all across America, and he eventually left the States and toured in Europe. Uh, he's widely considered uh, to be the first American blues artist to establish a presence in Europe and took advantage of this by going on a European tour, uh, starting in France, but unfortunately it was cut short uh, when he found out that Ian was diagnosed with ALS. So uh, he did, mm-hmm. you know, he really, but his music made its way across the pond, which is the important thing. And I find, I don't know if you do, but I find that like Europe has this kind of like weird obsession with like folk and Americana. Um, you know, and I mean, it seems like they're, they have a taste for it over there. And I don't know if it's just because you know, it's more kind of historical to America, so it's different and new to them. Um, but you definitely see the influence in, like, the Stones and uh, the Beatles. Like, you know, they, they were very, I think, highly influenced by this kind of music. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's because, you know, related to that area, you know, relative to Europe. I mean, we're so, we're babies. You know, we got our diapers on. Um that, you know, from the birth of this country, they, they don't know what music was going on in the births of their countries. I mean, yeah. they maybe kind of know, but uh, we're yeah. talking. And it wasn't jam. It wasn't thousands. a vibe. It wasn't a vibe. Yeah. I know that. Like it was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. It might have been some druids and some flutes and things. Yeah. I mean, it might have slapped, but I doubt it. Um, yeah. So, um, so he had his own show. If it, I was thinking like if you could host a game show. What what game show would you host? I know my uh, answer. Uh, it it would be the, the 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 my game show would air on ABC at eight o'clock on Monday nights, and it would be uh, uh, draw and quarter this politician. Oh yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, that's like a Black Mirror uh, game show. I like it. Yeah, I was gonna say oh, Price is Right, but I like yours better. Oh man, yeah, the Price is real right on mine. Yeah, no, I would. Uh, everybody wins, even if they get the wrong. They're like, yeah, no, you get to. Here's Mitch McConnell. That wasn't a, uh, just to clarify, that wasn't a direct threat on a politician. We don't have to edit No, 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 no. We'll cut all that. Cut it, David. Just, cut just it. Polite um, suggestion. Yeah, we'll cut that out. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 
Well, uh, we're getting towards the end here with our boy Lead Belly. So this dying man played his final show at the University of Texas in Austin in honor of his friend John Lomax, who died the year prior. Um, and it was a oh, fitting wow. tribute and kind of a full circle uh, goodbye to music um, and, and kind of a nice, you know, uh, gesture to John, even though they never made up uh, in this world. So um, on the 6th of December, 1949, uh, Hoodie Ledbetter uh, passed away um, and it was he was 61 years young. Um, and in that short amount of time, he was able to change music forever. Um, if you think about it in the twenties, he was serving life in prison, um, and for killing one of his family members in the thirties, he was in prison again. Uh, he ends up suing his friend and mentor. And then in the forties, he's a married man, has his own radio show, a you know, touring music career, um, you know, that took him all the way to Europe and is one of the most recognizable faces in American music. Um, you know, in the forties, despite a little thing called world war two, uh, you know, he had hit his stride and really cemented his legacy in music as an artist and influenced so many people from Beatles and Rolling Stones to Bob Dylan and, uh, especially Nirvana, um, which is, you know, maybe there's none of them and maybe there's no Justin Wells, who knows? Uh, we have no idea what his impact was, uh, through that time. So, you know, he could have been inmate three, four, eight, five, two, um and instead he's the lead belly that we know today so how about that lead belly uh what a crazy ass tale of crime and fortune uh hopefully uh you know you go give lead belly a spin between the dogs and the screaming song uh now let's switch gears a little bit for a quick draw round with our friend justin wells oh god music 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 and then tombstone quotes tombstone quote tombstone quote and then <laughs> Skin that smoke wagon and see what happens. Uh, all right. So then, uh, all right, here we go. I got plenty. You guys of ready? I don't. Yeah, I got plenty of. Fr- I don't. Uh, so yeah, here we go. Uh, your favorite venue to play, hands down. Why? That's tough, and you're gonna piss somebody off. But um, I got to give love to the Southgate House up in Newport, Kentucky. Man, I've been working with Marilla, I think, exclusively since the first time I played there, which at this point has to have been ten years ago or better. I don't know that I've played another venue in the area since. I Damn. love it. Um, I, I kind of thought that'd be your answer, but that's good. Uh, oh, good. What about somewhere? You, what about somewhere you want to play and haven't? And we'll start the petition after the show. Uh, you're talking specifically about a venue. Yeah. What's a, what's a goal? What's a, what's a spot that you see and you're like, yep, two years, one year, I want to be there. I think I'd like to do the rhyming. Uh, that's fresh in my mind, you know, after that Justin Towns Earl tribute. Um, I think I'd like to do the rhyming. Yeah. Let's get it. We'll, I'll get the petition going after the show. We'll make it happen. Uh, what's the experience like working with, uh, like Dwayne and shooter? Like what was, you know, how did those relationships come about? Uh, shooter, I I was drunk and I asked him and he was drunk and he said, yes. And I thought that would be the end of it. I just asked him, frankly, I thought he might just put his name on it and, and barely care. And quite the opposite. Uh, I think a day or two later when that hangover wore off, he texted me, he said, send me demos. Uh, Damn. and we were the first, you know, I take a lot of pride in this, took a lot of pride in this then certainly do now. We were the first act that he had ever produced other than himself. Um, wow. and I think he killed it, man. I mean, like that's not easy. And, uh, I'm sure he was probably kind of like as nervous about dealing with it as we were, but, uh, he really, he showed us how to be in the studio, you know, how to be produced, how to be recorded. Um, and 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 we drank far too much. <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, man. Um, take me through like writing United State because that was like a totally different type of album for you. Um, yeah. You know, as far as the structure of it, like where did you decide like, OK, like this is what I want to do. And like, how did you piece that thing together? I think that record is always going to be this kind of redhead stepchild to me. And it's got nothing to do with the record itself. And it has everything to do with when we released it, which we suspected might be the case but it had to come out i wanted to come out but uh you know man that was kind of my like five year plan right like that was gonna be my fourth record because i thought it would take that long to piece it together the way i wanted to um and i'd shown Dwayne what i think was the one song i had ready for it which was the screaming song uh and he said we need to do that and i was like well that's 
that's a few records from now that's not ready and he's like then write it <laughs> so I, so i so i got to write man but the that album existed uh as ideas not even lyrics just ideas of how it's going to sound sonically before it existed i wanted it to sound like a life you know sound like being born and in, in all these different phases of life and 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 then death um because i was reflecting on man i sure was really into metallica as a teenager man i sure really got into country music as a 21 year old uh, around the time i got into jim beam you know what i mean like <laughs> there's these sonics i feel like that are reflective of where you're at in life and i just kind of mm -hmm. wanted to speak to that and then just and then just kind of guess it you know the 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 ages I've not lived through yet, but this isn't very rapid fire, is it? You asked a, a non rapid fire question. They never are. It's just like a name, so I can have a cool transition with some guns. Um, just so just speed that... up my answer. Just make no. I mean, dude, that album means a lot. Like I love that album, and it means a lot to me. Know. And I'm glad you said that. I, I'm 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 hella proud of it. We crushed it, um, and uh, and I'm glad my name is on it. I, I, it's it's. Dwayne and I Wait. talked about putting a record out that, um, that that we would be proud of and our kids would be proud of and our grandkids would be proud of. And, and I think we did that. Hell yeah. Um, there's an intro. I forget. I think you told me once before about the cover art, like that you kind of picked it out of a, a photo from a friend or something. And then, you know, we don't know who she was and, <laughs> and all that. Cause, cause it's very like, I have it hanging up in my living room. I mean, it's, yeah. it's on the wall in my living room. And so it's very like grabbing, you know, when people come around the corner. Yeah. I, I do know who she is now. I, I've, I've found her through her, uh, through her niece on Facebook, which was, uh, which was a long trek, but, uh, long story short, Keith Neltner, who's the artist that put together that record, Keith has done work for Allison Chains and Tudor Jennings and uh, and Hank the Third, some of those iconic Hank the Third covers. Um, but he he was he was showing me a proof of concept, which was you know he's working on this idea that we talked about, and he was showing me different photos. There were going to be kind of like multiple photos of different people, um, and he showed me that photo, man, and and uh, it was so striking and. Uh, in fact, her hair, I mean, my cousins have commented on this, like she looked like my mamaw who passed while we were making the record. And so that was probably at play too. Um, but anyway, I said, man, you know, that's a great photo. Like, could I, could I use your photo? And he said, that's not my photo. And I said, oh, well, who is it? Let's see if we can license it. And he said, it's an open license photo. Um, wow. We can use it legally. And I said, well, uh, that's cool. I would like to use it morally too. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I found the, you know, I, I think he knew who the photographer was and I tracked him down and, and, and talked to him and, and sent some coin over there, but, um, they're both, her name's Maria. She's in Mexico. He's in Mexico. His name is Christian. I'm blanking on his last name right now. Um, super sweet guy, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of just, it worked out perfectly and also was just indicative of what we were going for, man, which is like trying to make a thing that resonated with anybody and everybody. Yeah, I think you did. It's great. Um, I can't. I always turn people onto that record whenever I'm trying to introduce people to new music. So it's a, it's a great piece of work. Um, these are going to be much faster. What shoe size? What uh, what's your shoe size? Uh, fourteen four E, I think, in boots. Yeah. God damn. In Ariat boots. All right. Much, yeah, man. that's what I wear. Cool. Only because. Uh, <laughs> only because. I know. Uh, I, I, you gave me your hand me downs. I, yeah, only because Tacovas won't do a deal with me, so uh, maybe I'll switch if they start sponsoring the show. Um, Burgoo or seafood boil? Uh, definitely crawfish boil for sure. All right, Burgoo's That's great cool. though. Yeah, it's a, it's it's an acquired taste, but I like it. Um, <laughs> have you ever considered acting? Because I think like I saw Chris Stapleton in Game of Thrones, and I was just thinking like you would be great as like a character actor um in like game of thrones sons of anarchy like you would have crushed um so i don't know maybe just think about it if you haven't yet i'll beat that i played a, a i played a, the guy the big giant dude carrying out the snakes in the snake handle in church and one of shooters videos so go look oh, that up. dude yeah so let's let's talk after that i think we can hook you up with some people and get you get you on some sets because i think i think there's a future there um so coming up you'll be playing at the historic ohio theater in madison indiana uh in february opening up for uh ward davis i believe um yep. i of course uh am from madison and uh you know it's um 
definitely a, a cool little town uh, for sure. Um, high school Matt. It is. Uh, High School Matt definitely put the moves on some ladies in the Ohio Theater at Nicolas Cage's Family Man uh, in like 2004, 2005 area, I think. Uh, that was a cool little theater, so I'm glad to see it getting some new life. Um, it actually uh, had a movie premiere there in 1958 for uh, Some Came Running with uh, Dean Martin, Shirley MacLaine, and Frank Sinatra, uh, who s- lived in Madison and filmed the movie there. Uh, so that's a little... Little tidbit of history for you. Now you and Ward Madison are going to go burn it, burn it down. Anybody that's not been to Madison, Indiana, should go. I mean, it, it is a beautiful little river town, um, and I I pick on Indiana a lot, but Madison rules. Yeah, it's a nice little spot. Um, I like I like going back when I can. Um, so, where can people find your wares, your such, your information, your tour dates, all that kind of stuff? justinwellsmusic.com because that asshole that works for Fox News has justinwells.com and he won't sell it to me. Damn. You hear that? If we got any hackers listening, uh, we're trying to get that get domain. To Let's hacking. go. Let's get go. To hacking. Um, yeah, so... All right, boys, the trail's been blazed. Thanks for joining us for this history lesson of Caddo Parish, the land that gave us the legend of Lead Belly and the minstrel mountain of a man, Justin Wells. Thank you to the Country Music's Dead team. Uh, Thank you, as always, to everyone involved, including our audio man, David. Thanks to West Fork Whiskey for supporting the show and the Audily team for executive producing. And a special thanks to our guest, Justin Wells, for spending so much time with me today. Uh, Look him up again at justinwellsmusic.com. Catch him in Mad Tucky with Ward Davis, February 25th. And uh, stream his music whenever and wherever you can. Uh, Justin, do you have any parting wisdom for our 12 listeners? (laughs) <laughs> to you 12 well hopefully one of them's from Caddo Parish and uh, here's your parting word of wisdom you're going to learn a word that you already thought you knew Louisiana has four syllables uh, my granny worked for the state and that is official Louisiana is some uh, northerner bullshit let's go Louisiana. let's go you learned it here folks well that's a wrap and giddy up <laughs>